Great. Thank, thanks very much, Martin. Um, so I'm Professor of Climate Change Impacts in the School of Engineering at Newcastle University, just to introduce myself. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Tom Matthews. Um, Tom holds the position of Senior Lecturer in Environmental Geography at King's College London. His research career began, though, with a PhD in glacier climate interactions in 2013. He then spent the best part of the next decade researching the planet's most extreme weather and its impacts on society, with his most substantial contributions coming from the study of deadly heat waves and particularly extreme humid events, including their drivers and their projected changes under climate change. His interest in glaciers and extreme weather intersected in 2019 when he was asked to co-lead the meteorology component of the National Geographic and Rolex Perpetual Planet Everest Expedition. <laughs> The team went on to break numerous Guinness World Records, including establishing the highest weather station in the world at 8,430 metres above sea level. In 2022, Tom was back on Mount Everest as the team installed a new weather station at the highest point possible on the Nepalese part of the mountain, just below the summit at 8,810 metres. Tom's research is now working with these frontier data to understand how the precarious snow and ice resources stored at extreme altitude may respond to climate change. From deadly tropical heat waves to severe cold, mountain, cold weather mountain windstorms, Tom's research aims to map the limits of Earth's climate envelope and to chart its course as it's shifted by human-caused climate change. So I'm delighted to uh, invite Dr. Tom Matthews to present our public lecture this evening on measuring Mount Everest weather. Well, thank you, Hayley, for the introduction. And thank you for everyone turning out this afternoon or this evening. It's lovely to see you all here. And I must say that introduction made it sound like there was a, uh, an organized vision to my research. Because I think in reality, I just stumble from interesting weather event to interesting weather event. But thank you very much, Hayley. Um, so, yes, I'm here to talk to you about measuring Mount Everest weather. I'll tell you this four-year story, this four-year quest, tell you uh, how we did what Hayley just summarised there, installing these highest weather stations in the world. But to begin with, why? That's what I'll start with. I'm going to tell you about a story that, well, I'll tell you a story that involves a lot of um, effort, a lot of cost, um, and I, I think it's very important to frame that appropriately. Why go to such lengths? Why is measuring Mount Everest weather worthy of our, of our efforts and of our, of our precious resources? And then I'll tell you something, or quite a lot, about how. So how we did it. Um, and a spoiler alert, there was a small part in this. Um, a Sherpa team, or Sherpa teams, were the, the heroes of this, of this effort. So I'll tell you a lot about the how, I'll show you lots of pictures, and describe the journey up the mountain, the challenges. And then I'll also, as this is a university, I'll also talk a little bit about what we're learning, some of the science. So the science will start, will frame the talk, why go to such lengths, and then along the way, I was telling the story of how we put the weather stations in, the challenges, I'll tell you what we're finding. So to begin with, a story that is um, unfortunately very familiar, I think, to everyone in the room, the climate's changing. Not a case of what will happen, not just what will happen. The climate's already changed a lot. A lot being around 1.2 degrees of warming since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. You can see that map ticking away up there, the colours indicating uh, the warming that we've seen since pre-industrial. As we move, that map moves from being predominantly blue to predominantly yellow and red, indicating the warming trend. Now, that increase in global mean air temperature, or the increase in air temperature, is just one symptom of the Earth system accumulating heat. Accumulating heat predominantly because of the emissions of greenhouse gases from society. The rising temperatures bring with them all sorts of consequences for us. Be it, for example, a rise in the frequency and intensity of extreme heat events, so heat waves. A rise in the frequency and intensity of heavy precipitation events that cause floods, for example. And perhaps even an increase in the intensity of the strongest storms we see on Earth, the hurricanes or tropical cyclones. So extreme weather, broadly. 
and increase the frequency and intensity of some types of extreme weather as the climate is warming. But today, or this evening, we'll turn our gaze to this, the widespread retreat of glaciers that we're seeing. The glaciers respond in quite a straightforward way to climate change. As it warms, we see more melt and more sublimation, more mass lost from glaciers. We do perhaps see a bit more input of snow to the glaciers, but that doesn't compensate the increase in, in loss, predominantly from melt. Glaciers worldwide are going backwards and going backwards at a very quick rate. Where they stop, though, is a function of a couple of things. One, how much warming we see. Two, how the glaciers respond to that warming. And both of those questions are difficult to answer. But how much ice have we lost? How urgent is this? Well, over the last 20 years, glaciers in, glaciers in high mountain Asia, and Everest is in the Himalaya, that's in high mountain Asia. That also, though, encompasses this, this stat, high mountain Asia, encompasses the Karakoram, for example, and the Pamir, other mountain ranges. In that region, the last 20 years, we've lost nearly 20 billion tonnes per year. So what does that mean? How much is 20 billion tonnes? It sounds like a big number, doesn't it? But it's hard to picture. I find it hard to picture. So a picture might help us. This is Hyde Park, that you see here. I do now live and work in London, so this feels like an appropriate example. About a kilometre across. So we would have a cube of water, a kilometre on its base, and a thousand metres high, that's taller than the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world, which is about 800 metres high. That would be one billion tonnes. We lost 20 of those per year over the last 20 years. It's equivalent to eight Hyde Parks buried to a depth of more than 1,000 metres. Now, where does this stop? We've just talked about what's happening. We're losing an enormous amount of mass from these glaciers in high mountain Asia. What comes next, I alluded to at the beginning, is somewhat unknown, or rather there's lots of uncertainty. The biggest one, that I won't talk about very much, biggest one is how much warming are we going to see over the rest of this century? That depends fundamentally on what we do, our emissions of greenhouse gases. We can't know where that experiment, a very dangerous experiment, will stop. So we can't know what the future climate will look like, because it fundamentally depends on us. But we also don't really have a very good understanding of how the, the glaciers will respond to the warming that may occur. And the reason for that, or one significant reason for that, is that we don't have very many weather stations out in the places that these glaciers are located. Weather stations measuring the current state of the climate. For example, as of 2019, there were no weather stations <coughs> in the world located above 6,000 metres above sea level. And above that altitude, we have more than 2,500 cubic kilometres of water stored as ice. We, have no, we had no weather stations at those altitudes to measure the climate in which that ice was being stored. Less than 20 were above 5,000 metres, where there's 11,000 cubic kilometres of water stored as ice. To give you some an analogy, to give you an analogy, that's enough to supply the time for almost 8,000 years. There's a lot of water stored up there that we're not monitoring, stored as ice, glacial ice. Now, why does that matter that we're not monitoring the climate up there? Well, Picture this as our glacier for a minute, as our glaciers for a moment. And think about what the impact of warming could be on these ice cubes. If these ice cubes are in an environment where it's minus 10 degrees Celsius, what's the impact of two or three degrees of warming? Warmer ice. What if it's instead stored, stored in an environment where the temperature is minus one? Well, two degrees of warming then means melting, a transition. The base climate matters. The temperature in which the ice is stored matters. So we need to know the baseline climate to have a good understanding of what the impact of any warming will be. The same principle also applies for understanding what's going to happen to that big input, the key input to glaciers. So glaciers, they grow from snowfall, or rather snow is the input, and then they lose mass, predominantly from melting. So we need to know the baseline climate to understand what the impact of warming will be on melting, and also to understand what the impact of warming will be on precipitation. If the snow is falling 
in air temperatures of, again, of minus 10. Warming, well, what will that do? Give us warmer snow, perhaps a bit more snow, because the amount of water that the atmosphere can hold, the number of snowflakes, if you like, goes up with warming. But what if that snow was instead falling in a climate or an atmosphere that was minus one or minus two, and we had a couple of degrees of warming? Well, instead of snow, we now have something completely different. We now have rain. And that's no longer an input to the glacier. The rain is actually a source of melt energy. So the baseline climate really matters. If we don't know the baseline climate, understanding what the impact of warming will be on glaciers is very uncertain. So it would certainly help to have some more measurements, more measurements of the current climate in the mountains that these glaciers reside. But that's difficult to do. Why are they not there? They're not there because logistically it's very hard to put weather stations at these sorts of altitudes. So in that context, you'll see why we went to this effort, or at least part of the story of why we went to this effort to put these weather stations in. But a, a heuristic or, let's say, a picture we'd have in your mind is that we're used to thinking about the topography right, in, the, in the mountains in particular. If we go hiking, we go climbing, we're used to thinking about the topography, the importance of knowing what the topographic surface looks like, or what the topography looks like. We represent that with a contour map. The contour maps, or well, contour maps have been well produced, the topography of the Earth's surface is very well understood. We know the highest point on Earth is Mount Everest. We know the, the lowest point is the Marianas Trench. <coughs> now, you can think of the, any climate parameter, any atmospheric parameter, like temperature. It's continue, we could imagine that. It's a continuous surface. But we only have these spot measurements. Well, actually, worldwide, there's only around 10 to 20,000 weather stations operating at any one point in time. So we have 10 to 20,000 spot measurements of the air temperature field, even fewer of the wind speed field. So if you could picture the, the dearth of data in the mountains when it comes to weather data, we're doing this. We're walking in the dark. We have very, very little understanding of what the weather's currently like in the high mountains, where these weather stations are just oh, they're absent from. They're not there. So it's against this backdrop that National Geographic um, uh, emerge, in, they emerge into this landscape. This is the headquarters in, in Washington, D.C. And they had this, um, this idea, the Petrol Planet Programme, financed by, by Rolex. They wanted to essentially improve understanding of the, the critical Earth systems in the context of climate change. Three systems, the mountains, the rainforests, and the oceans. And in their work preparing for the big push in the mountains, they commissioned or invited some of the world's leading scientists to understand how important these mountain glaciers were for society. In the context of water resources, because it isn't actually obvious, right? glaciers store water as ice. What happens if you melt the glaciers? Well, they, they, they retreat. Do you have less water flowing through your catchment? Not necessarily, because we might see an increase in rainfall. It's not necessarily the case that you have less water downstream as the glaciers retreat. What glaciers are very, very important for is providing a reliable source of water to communities downstream when it isn't raining. For example, when it's hot, dry, and sunny, and it's not raining, the glaciers are melting more, and they're compensating for that low flow. So glaciers are very important providing reliable sources of water when there isn't rain. And National Geographic commissioned this commissioned this report, invited, convened leading scientists to understand where the most precious or vulnerable water tower regions were. Mountain areas of the world where glaciers were an important supply, or glaciers and snow, were very important in providing water to communities downstream. Very high profile paper published in Nature. If you look hard amongst the co-authors, you won't see me, but you will see one of your own, Bethan Davis, who's, who's in the audience, who is one of the co-authors on this paper. And one of the things that came out of this was, well, the Himalaya, the central Himalaya, just the headwaters of the Ganges Brahmaputra, is a very important water tower. Not number one, I'll come back to that at the end, but a very important water tower nonetheless. And they thought the best way to kick off this push to try and help fill that observational gap, to improve understanding of the world's water towers under climate change, was to launch a flagship expedition to Mount Everest. 
where we're going to go and try and fill in some of the gaps. I'll talk to you about the meteorology team's effort installing weather stations to fill the gap. There was far more going on in 2019. There was also a geology team that went, a mapping team that went, a glaciology team and a biology team that went. What does it take, though, to launch this effort, big scientific expedition to Mount Everest, the weather station bit that our folks on? Who's involved? It's not just scientists. I'll talk you through the cast here. So you have Aurora Elmore, she was leading the science effort at National Geographic, PhD in oceanography. And then to Gujaral, professor of earth sciences or geology at Tribhavan University in Nepal. He was the co-investigator or lead, uh, lead uh, sorry, co-PI, co-principal investigator from Nepal. Pete Athens, Mr. Everest seven times his email address, don't spam him afterwards, but he was our climbing lead. Summited the mountain seven times, one of the world's um, most famous mountaineers, accomplished mountaineers. Dawi Angsam Sherpa, international mountain guide, first female, I believe, to climb, or first Nepalese female, I believe, to climb K2, and also summited Everest. She was one of our key climbing leads. Paul Mieski, who has led very, very significant uh, ice core projects in Antarctica and Greenland. He was the co-PI um, along with Ananta. Panuru Sherpa, our lead Sherpa, you'll see some more pictures of him uh, later on. He was head of the Sherpa team in 2019. Sandra Elvin and Jiban Gamir. Sandra leading the Nat Geo, expedition, uh, Nat Geo Logistics and Jiban Gamir leading um, logistics in-country. He, uh, he operates Shangri Nepal Trek and is known as the fixer's fixer. It's what you need to get, get stuff done uh, in Nepal when you're flying lots of kit in and out of somewhere like Everest Base Camp. And then Baker Perry, along with myself. Baker Perry is a, a professor at Appalachian State University in the US. He and I were tasked with leading the, the meteorology team. We also worked with Tripavan University um, in Nepal, in Kathmandu. This is Debas Shrestha, a very good collaborator. And this is on the Tripavan campus, us testing the kit before heading out in 2019. So you need, we needed very good local uh, connections in order to facilitate this kind of research. So what I'm going to do now is talk you through the 2019 uh, story. So installing these weather stations that are there to fill this observational gap that I hope I've convinced you is a, is a worthy task. And we'll begin with the Fort Say weather station, 3,810 metres. This is all in 2019, our first weather station. Then we move up to base camp, 5,310 metres above sea level. And then it's weather station at camp two, 6,450 metres above sea level. South Cole, 7,945. And then the balcony station, 8,430 metres. So I'll talk you through this installation uh, process now. This is all in 2019 as part of this big, um, big Nat Geo expedition that had these other components too. And I'll give you the update for 2022 uh, a bit later on in the talk. So Fort Say, the location of the first weather station that we installed, 3,810 metres above sea level. This is, if you like, the, the median altitude of um, villages in the Khumbu region of Nepal. This is where most people are living, this sort of altitude. The Kumbu region of Nepal, there are no roads in here, so you fly into Lukla, which is a, it's an airport that you can fly into from Kathmandu, is the route that most people take. And then you trek over the course of a few days to reach Fort Say, this village here, where most of our Sherpa team came from. And you can see us here installing a fairly vanilla weather station. A weather station that you'll see in a moment has everything that's required to measure the amount of snow and rain, or broadly, the amount, or uh, collectively, the amount of precipitation that's falling. So we're recording everything that falls into this um, big jug here, if you like, this big cylinder. We're weighing that. That tells us how much precipitation is, is coming in. We have this baffling around the bucket to prevent the wind from blowing precipitation clear of the rim. Otherwise, we would underestimate the amount of precipitation that's falling. So we have the input in terms of precipitation measured here. And then we have the rest of the weather station over here that's measuring things like the, the amount of sunshine that's coming in from above, that's being reflected from below, the amount of thermal or long wave radiation that's coming in from the atmosphere and from the surrounding slopes, and it's being emitted by the surface below. We're measuring the air temperature, the relative humidity. There's a wind speed sensor on here somewhere. There's air pressure inside the box and there are some, some, some thermistors going into the ground measuring the temperature of the soil. All those things together give us enough to work out how much energy there is 
to evaporate water from the land surface. So we can work out the water balance at this altitude where people are farming and living, where we need to better understand the consequences of, of climate warming for. But it's a fairly vanilla installation. This is our next installation. This is a base camp and a very staged photo you see here, me working on one part of the station and Baker Perry working on, again, another, uh, another, the other component, the precipitation measuring component over here. The main camp, this is, this is Mount Everest Base Camp, is just behind the precipitation sensor around 500 metres away. That's where all the tents are, where people will be camped, ready to make their attempt on Mount Everest. This is that station again uh, in all its glory. So you can see this is the summit of Mount Everest here. Nupti, for those that know the mountain, close to 8,000 metres is just up here, and Lotz is just around the corner. And you can see, perhaps you can see, some yellow flecks down here. They're, they're the tent uh, base camp. And why not show you some of the data from, from this station that we're now a few years in? This is the year-to-date precipitation curves. So at any point, Look along, read along the x-axis to get the day of the year, and then what we're doing is accumulating, we're accumulating the precipitation through to that point, so you see how much precipitation has fallen throughout the year to that point, but just reading across the y-axis. And what I thought was interesting is, you look at the, the annual precipitation, something between 500 and 700 uh, millimetres for the three years that we have complete data for so far. Well, look, it's just like Newcastle. 608 millimetres. If you want to know what the weather at base camp is like, so in terms of precipitation, just hang around Newcastle for a while and you'll, you'll find out. <coughs> okay, but that, that's all quite vanilla so far. If you're used to working in these sorts of environments, so measuring the weather to help understand uh, glacier response to climate change, the weather stations I've just described to you, the, the, the setups, they're typical. So we deploy weather stations like that in other mountain regions around the world. So in Europe, in the Andes, etc. Um, they're not particularly challenging to install. You know, logistics uh, can support a kind of weight that has to be carried in. So there are no special challenges that emerge installing weather stations up to Everest Base Camp. The challenge comes from going higher, and there is a need to go higher, because half of the Kumbu Glacier is above about 5,500 metres above sea level, which is about here. We've just been looking at a weather station down here, a base camp, the halfway point in terms of where the, above this half the area is and below this half the area is, around 5,500 metres. We're going to have to go above the icefall, this is the famous Kumbu icefall, and into the western Coom up here if we want to get data, measure the baseline climate from the upper half of the glacier. Then it gets difficult because um, we have to carry everything on our backs and you have to climb. It's, it's really a different prospect going above base camp. So I'm now going to talk you through the rest of the, of the climb and, and what it took to get up there. So this is um, a little time lapse of uh, the climbers picking out the route through the icefall. So this was, well, was taken by some Nat Geo uh, media team that were there recording, documenting the expedition. This is a time lapse at, at night time. So you can see the climbers, their headlamps, picking out the route through, through the icefall. And this is actually how you first see climbers ascending from base camp. If you pop out your tent to go to the toilet in the middle of the night, you will see often a train of headlights going up through, through the icefall. It's a place you first encounter in the night. You encounter it in the night because it's, it's a bit safer then. The warmth of the day hasn't gone on to the fixed lines. The anchors are securing the fixed lines in the icefall. So the protection is, is well secured in the ice. Once the sun gets on it, protection can start to melt out, which means those fixed lines that are securing you that you're using to safeguard your journey through the ice fall uh, are melting out. You go in the night, everything's frozen, it's a bit safer. There are avalanches, though, that you hear coming down even in the night. So it's a, it's a scary place to be in the night when you can't see what's making the noise, what's rumbling off to the sides. So you wish it was daylight so you could see where you're going, and then when it is daylight, you wish it was dark again, because it's pretty frightening. You see these huge blocks this is going through the icefall. We're, we're quite close to the northern edge of the icefall here. And these enormous blocks have come down, come down relatively recently. You can tell that by the very angular nature of their edges. The longer they're out here, the more the snow melts and sublimates the edges and the more rounded they become. And it wasn't far from here that in, I think it was 2015, there was a very large avalanche that came down, unfortunately killed a number of Sherpa. And it was picked up in a weather station 
about five to 10 kilometers down valley, like this pulse of cold, dry air that came down. So it was that big, the avalanche, that the, the air mass it displaced could be detected five to 10 kilometers down valley, a very frightening place to be indeed. So you try and get through it as quickly as you can. Um, there's just some pictures to give you an idea of what the ice fall is like. Lots of ladders. So if, if any of you come from a mountaineering background, this is clearly, it's odd. It's a different, different prospect entirely, ascending ladders in, in crampons. It's something that is, is atypical. Ladders in all configurations and blocks of ice of all configurations to climb over. Didn't know this was an arch until coming down and looking at the photos that someone had taken during the climb. Just thought it was a, a solid mass of ice we were ascending. Ladders horizontally. And you're trying to move quickly, of course, because the, the, real, the real danger here is the objective hazard that you, you can't really reduce, and that's blocks of ice toppling. So you want to move through quickly, because that's, that's the best thing you can do to minimize your, your risk. But in 2019, certainly, there were these uh, periods which climbers were um, really congested, because the weather wasn't very good for very many days in 2019. So when good climbing weather emerged, everyone went to rush through. And pictures like this were doing the rounds in 2019. Very congested. We waited here. You can see some of our team members in yellow, very recognizable. Waited here for around about an hour to ascend these, these two ladders that were here. It's a real choke point. But I also wanted to show that the Kumbu Ice Fall, it, it has very it has different characters depending on the day that you're, you know, the particular circumstances that you find yourself ascending. This is the picture that was doing the rounds in 2019. This is 2022, actually, but it just shows you a very different flavour of the ice fall. You can be up there entirely on your own. Not always sunny either. More familiar atmospheric conditions for those of us that spend time in the mountains over here. So not always brilliant sunshine, but also ascending in the, the calmness and strangeness of, uh, of low cloud. Whatever. So you can have a very um, solitary experience going through the ice fall. It's not all, it's not all crowds. Popping out from the top of the Kumbu Icefall, you'll emerge at the serene, the serene uh, place of what we call Camp One. It's a real respite compared to the chaos of the Kumbu Icefall. So the first time you, you, you head up above the Icefall, you'll spend one night here acclimatizing. That's looking back from Camp One down the direction of base camp. So the Kumbu Icefall is just off this crest. OK, but from Camp 1, not really much happens there. Just a, a, a pit stop to help us acclimatise the first time up. We're going to continue the journey, heading up the Western Coombe, and we're going to stop off at Camp 2 up here, which is where we, the next weather station was in, installed in 2019. A little video just to give you a flavour of what Camp 2 is like, taken by Abindra Kadka. You see the tents here on this lateral moraine, on the northern side of the, the Coombe Glacier here. 6,400, 500 metres above sea level. Also known as advanced base camp. So up here, you can still expect to eat your dinner in a mess tent, sitting on a seat and having a table. It's extraordinary. For us, though, what's more um, memorable and more significant about Camp 2 is it was the site of our first weather station above the ice fort that we installed. A much smaller setup than what you saw lower down when we had precipitation gauges as well. Here, we're just measuring everything, the parameters or the variables that allow us to evaluate how much energy there is to melt the glacier surface. So the sunshine, the long wave radiation, the air temperature, the relative humidity, the wind speed, and the air pressure. We're situated just off, the, off from the side of the glacier, which is down just in the foreground here. And we're off from the main, from the glacier, because we wanted a site that the weather station should survive uh, longer in, so we can bolt it to bedrock here. We still thought this wouldn't last very long. We were warned that Camp 2 was frequently scoured by avalanches during the monsoon, so we chose the cheaper set of instruments to put up here, thinking they're somewhat disposable. Ironically, this site has been fantastic. We've had a continuous record and now wish we'd put the expensive radiometer on here. And this was, for a very short time, the highest weather station in the world, for about a week. And then the Chinese put a higher station up on the north side, about 20 metres higher. Not that we're counting, of course. And from there, we're climbing higher. We're now going up the Lotsi face. You see that in the video playing out here. 
and you see the South Coal Weather Station being installed, <coughs> 7,945 metres above sea level. And this was the highest weather station in the world when it, was, when it was installed. And when we get to this altitude, and just to point out what's behind us, Camp 4, the highest camp on the, the normal Nepalese or southern climate route, is just down here, about 50 metres below us. And this is the upper reaches of the Kumbu Glacier, the highest extent of the Kumbu Glacier. Also, in some commutes by some people, called the South Coal Glacier and the highest glacier in the world. You see the Bergschrund, the top of the glacier, marked out <coughs> by this big crack running along here. And this is Everest South Summit up here. And the climbing route, in case I don't remember to point it out later, heads up here, the so-called triangular face. The balcony is up here. And then we traverse up here, the south summit, and then on the summit ridge towards the true summit, Mount Everest. When we get to this altitude, the weather stations are very different. Still very different, or different again, from that Camp 2 station, which was a lighter variant, or rather a uh, stripped down variant of the stations I showed you for Base Camp and for Fort Say. By the time we get up here, weight is very important. This whole system is modular, different bits can be taken off, put in backpacks, and the whole thing weighs 50 kilograms. So what do we have? We have solar panels to provide power or to charge the batteries, which are in one of these <coughs> Pelican cases. We have a satellite transmitter to send data out in near real time. We have redundant sensors, so we have two temperature sensors. We have three wind speed sensors. This one, this one, and this one, which is a pitot tube. It's the same type of sensor that records the wind speed on aeroplanes. So single solar and long wave radiation sensor because they're very expensive. We couldn't afford two of everything. And some powerful battery, well, I've given you the batteries, so in one of these boxes, and a data logger in the other, in the other case. And the highest, the heaviest individual component is around 10 kilograms, I think, from memory. So all of this stuff can be taken apart, put in backpacks, and carried up. All the sensors have undergone special low temperature characterization to understand their response at low temperatures. The mast itself, aluminium, lightweight, and it's been custom engineered and tested with CFD, computational fluid dynamics, to work out the forces that will be applied given certain wind conditions and to test whether it's, um, whether it's strong enough to withstand those forces. So it's a, it's a custom tripod. This, this system is built by uh, Campbell Scientific. And we intended to install that weather station. So we had one at the South Coal, and then 2019, we also intended to go up to the summit, or as close as possible to the summit, a place called the Bishop Rock we wanted to install in 2019. But our plan didn't work out because it, I mentioned the weather in 2019. It wasn't good um, for climbing. We only had about, I think, two or three days of climbable conditions when the w winds are low enough that you can climb to the summit safely enough. And that's about a threshold of about 20 metres per second. If it goes above 20 metres per second, we can expect the wind to be blowing us off our climbing position. It gets risky. So we only had a couple of days of climbing, right, the right climbing conditions in 2019. Everyone was channeled through that, and we had to turn around in 2019 because we just couldn't move. This picture was taken by Nimsdai, who is um, of uh, 14 peaks fame, it has the world record for climbing the 14 8,000 meter peaks in record time. So if you've seen the Netflix, doc Netflix documentary, um, Project Possible or something like that, I can't, remember the I, remember, I can't remember the name, he took this picture in 2019. We had to stop at the balcony and install what was then the highest weather station. So you see us working away here. So us, this is Baker and I, and also the Sherpa team that did the majority of the, of the hard work in 2019. And then off the back of that, this is the end of the 2019 expedition, we, 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 carried, we progressed with the science, learning what we could from the data that were coming in. So what kinds of things are we learning? Well, one, that having this network of weather stations, monitoring the weather year round has shown some very interesting things. For example, just anecdotally, the, the monsoon, a period when climbers and everyone on the mountain, because the avalanche risk is so high, would be a fantastic time if the avalanche risk were not high to climb. It's warm and it's calm on, on the summit. Warmer than, for example, Mount Washington, which is um, a mountain in the Appalachians, during its winter. So it's not, an, not unusually cold, even in the context of um, relatively 
moderate peaks in the middle latitudes. What else? Well, some in, I'm running a bit tight for time, so I'll just I'll, I'll highlight some of the fun things in the, in the climbing context. The pressure, air pressure, changes quite markedly day to day in the winter. The amount of oxygen, and our weather, our weather stations should tell us that, the amount of oxygen follows very closely the, amount, the, air, the air pressure. So what we'll be able to see with the weather stations is that the amount of oxygen that's available to climbers varies a lot from day to day in the winter. If you're climbing without supplemental oxygen, it really matters which day you choose to try and climb Mount Everest, particularly in the winter. And people are trying to do this now. It's a new challenge, trying to climb Mount Everest in the winter without oxygen. What our weather stations are showing is that it really matters which day you choose. So weather forecast for air pressure on the summit of Everest would be a very valuable thing for people right at the edge uh, or trying to push the envelope in terms of human physiology and climbing. It turns out, by the way, in case you're wondering, the pressure doesn't correlate very well with the wind speed. So if you were choosing a day to summit Mount Everest in the winter based on the winds, you might be okay for wind, but you might not be okay for the amount of oxygen. A more significant finding in the context of the introduction is that we see incredibly high amounts of solar radiation at high altitude here, so sunshine. And it looks like, depending on which physical, physically based model you use, and this is a really interesting research question going forward, there might be sufficient solar radiation to generate a lot of melt if ice becomes exposed. Ice is darker than snow. Being darker, it absorbs more of that sunshine and melt, according to some models that we use, a lot of melt is possible once snow is removed. According to other models that we use, it's not. So there's a real research question that the, these observations have, have highlighted. We need to improve, or at least better constrain our models to understand how sensitive these resources are to changing reflectivity, in other words, changing albedo. But the sunshine up here is so intense that sometimes, or quite often, it exceeds what comes in the top of the Earth's atmosphere. We get forward scattering at the edge of clouds and multiple reflections off the surrounding snowy peaks that we can end up with more solar radiation landing on the glacier surfaces up here than comes in at the top of the Earth's atmosphere. So that's been very interesting. But unfortunately, in 2020, the feed from the two highest weather stations went dead. And in 2021, we planned to go back in 2020, but as you all know, something happened in 2020. Our Sherpa team, Sherpa colleagues, went back in 2021 and saw the balcony station <coughs> laying like this, been knocked over by some very strong winds. The South Coal station, we noticed that the winds weren't making much sense, even though the satellite telemetry feed had continued. And this is why the sensors had just been ripped apart by the winds. The last gust we recorded was 66 metres per second, around 150 miles an hour before... Um, the, the sensors failed. They're meant to be good to 100 metres per second, but clearly something in this environment tests them too much. So a decision was taken to go back in 2022 to maintain the South Coal Station and to replace the balcony station with ideally a site higher up, an installation higher up. Why? Because there were some things that we didn't yet know. We didn't understand those high altitude winds well enough to protect climbers when they're most exposed, to improve weather forecasts for those climbers that are, are risking their lives going to the top. And it's not just the, the rich climbers that are going up there, it's the Sherpa that are going up there. Weather plays a hand in around 25% of the deaths on Mount Everest. There's a strong local incentive to improve the accuracy of the weather forecast up there. We didn't have enough data to do that well with the limited set that we had from the initial deployment. There were also some tantalising questions. With this amount of solar radiation that we observed at the South Coal, and with some of our modelling, suggested that sometimes the summit snowpack might melt. It might be very close to melting. Perhaps more warming could tip things over a threshold, Mount Everest summit could start to melt, and the summit height would decrease. It's perhaps not a very you know, big significance generally in terms of water resources, but a messaging platform to drum home the impacts of warming on the high mountain regions that that was significant. So we wanted to go and get a station back in this area, or rather higher up again. So we went back in 2022, back to base camp, with a new team of Sherpa, a lot from our first expedition, who were trained and now expert in the weather stations, and we carried on climbing. We had our Bindra Kadka with us this time too. So myself, Baker, and our Bindra Kadka, a Nepalese young scientist. We were the three scientists, the Sherpa team, much the same from 2019 with a few additions. Back through the ice fall, back through the Western Coombe, and then we land this day, um, this is May 8th in 2022, so of course last year now, isn't it? And we were due to try for the summit from Camp 2, put the weather station in at Bishop Rock and maintain the South Coal. 
um, on the morning of May 8th. We're going to leave, we're going to spend one night at Camp 3, which is half of the Lotsu face, then progress onto Camp 4, and then move to the summit. That's the normal, that's the normal route. But then Baker was on the radio, and well, he was outside the tent actually, early on, the morning of the 8th, and we were due to have a leisurely start, because Camp 3 is not very far away from Camp 2, half a day. And he's saying, I think we need to come, we need to come and look at the weather forecast, because I think our plans need to change. And to cut a long story short, whilst we were at Camp 2, the forecast deteriorated and deteriorated. We were targeting the 10th for our installation. We were using weather forecasts from the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, looking at wind speeds, metres per second. I didn't have any units on this plot, so forgive me, but metres per second. And this is our threshold. We know this from mining uh, data on successful climbs. Whenever the winds are below the lines and the envelope is majority below this orange line, we think it's okay for climbing. When it goes above, we, we don't think it is. We were originally targeting the 10th. We left base camp, I think, actually on the 6th. And this is the forecast we had. The 10th looked good. Keep your eye on the 10th. And by the morning of the 8th, when Bake's outside my tent, we're now above that threshold for the 10th. So it doesn't look good. So what we had to do, we had a decision to make. We either give up for this, for this push and go back to base camp and get more supplies and wait until the weather improves and then make our attempt. Or... We try and do something that I thought was risky, but it turned out everyone else thought it was a good idea, and it probably was in hindsight. We leave that morning and we try and go all the way. So we try and skip Camp 3, we go straight to Camp 4, rest for a very short period of time, and then go up to try and get there on the 9th instead. So we're going to, I should have this slide up to tell you that story. The normal route, Camp 2, so you would leave here, we're going to leave her there on the 8th, that was originally the plan. Spend the night of the 8th here, go up here, rest for half, uh, many hours until the early hours of the 10th. So we'd have had the night of the 9th, early hours of the 10th. We'd head up and try and put the weather station up here. But because of the weather being what it was, what we decided to do was go straight from Camp 2. And this was late in the day too. You would normally, if you're trying to go up from Camp 2 to South Cole, you would leave early. We left, I think it was something like 10 a.m., not an alpine start, and had to go all the way to the South Coal, and we would get there quite late, and then only have maybe an hour or so to rest, and then have to try and make the attempt. Um, I had little to offer in terms of was it a sensible idea. I said, I have no idea if we can do that. That's hard. Um, but it was either that or go back and wait. Restock, bring stuff up to Camp 2, and we didn't know that we'd get another chance. So the decision was taken to do that. And I have very few pictures of what followed because it was a frantic rush. This is one picture taken from soon after that attempt began. And you can see some of this, some of the people here are part of our team. There are also other teams climbing up to Camp 3 to stock their high camps and, and begin their, making their preparations for attempting the summit. But you see us, we've just set off from Camp 2, and this is taken on the morning of the, of the 8th as we, as we race up towards the South Coal. And then arrived at the South Coal, not a picture from then because I wasn't in the mood to take pictures. It was a real rush. Um, actually got there in the dark, we got there about 8 or 9 p.m. and was met by Kami Temba Sherpa. This is Kami Temba and this is Tenzing. They were, Tenzing was the lead Sherpa in 2022, Kami Temba was number two. And he came down, he'd raced ahead, got there before me, he came down with a mug of hot chocolate just when I was probably half an hour outside of Camp 4. A real guardian angel or saviour appearing with that. It was a long, hard day, and I'll, and I'll forever be indebted and grateful for him coming out. And what then happened was the Sherpa basically took care of our Bindra and I, who had you know, pushed ourselves to get up there a long way behind the Sherpa. They took care of us, fed us, watered us, and made sure that we were as rested as we could be, had a couple of hours there, and about 40 minutes of trying to sleep before we set off again to go to this, uh, make the attempt in the Bishop Rock. And we'd have had no chance of being in a state to even, to even begin making that journey if it wasn't for them. It was extraordinary, the effort that, that they went to. And then no pictures of what followed either because it was a frantic climb through, through the night. We, we leave about 11.30 at night and then climb through the night. And then this is us arriving at the Bishop Rock and all working. The summit is 40 metres up here. And I'm running low on time, so I'll summarise. It took three hours of struggling up here to install the weather station. And that wind, it looked OK on the forecast, was just on the edge of being OK up here. First Sherpa team members to get up here, 
said, it's a shame, we're going to have to go back, it's too windy. And then we discussed a bit more and decided that maybe we'd wait for Tenzing, the lead Sherpa, to get there and we'd reconsider. Because I thought, oh, not again. We're not going to go all the way up here and turn around now. So we didn't. We worked away. Three hours later, the weather station was up. In the, me in the meantime, it did go up to the summit, mainly, and this will sound ridiculous, but to keep warm. Three hours of milling around down there at the weather station. We were all taking turns to try and connect the wires, the last wires, and... The Sherpa were far better at this than I. Their physiology is, is much better, dense capillary network in the, in the fingers. My fingers, as you'll see, got very frozen. I was useless at putting the wires in. So for the last stages, I was watching while the Sherpa were doing all of the hard work. And this is really the very final stages you see um, being completed here. And the, and the two key players in this game, Tenzing and Kami Temba there, putting the finishing touches to the weather station. And these are the first data that came out from the weather station at the Bishop Rock. So you can see the temperatures were hovering. So this is just after we installed the station. When we were installing, they were probably between minus 20 and minus 22. Uh, wind speeds were about 20 metres per second. They were actually faster than we would have liked. We'd have seen this in the forecast up there. We wouldn't have gone. So the weather was tough putting this in. Some other interesting things that maybe I'll talk about in the questions or some insights is the radiation regime up there is absolutely wild. You see this really intense sunshine, the black curves, close to the top of atmosphere, solar radiation during the day in clear sky conditions. At night, the long wave radiation really drops. And if the surface were to equilibrate with the long wave radiation that's coming in, it would drop, this in the spring, it's about minus 70 degrees. The radiation up here is, is wild. Uh, then, very briefly, I'll say that the night at the South Coal afterwards, we descended, had to spend a night at the South Coal, was incredibly unpleasant. Didn't sleep a wink. That's a picture of me at the South Coal afterwards. Because those winds, that the forecast said were coming, they came. It was blowing 20 to 30 metres per second during that night. The whole tent was moving, snow was piling in. It was really, really miserable. But interesting, the forecast certainly was on. We could not have gone up there on the 10th. So it's a testament to how good the forecasts are in this region. We now know that from having the weather stations there. It gives us a basis to improve the forecast for climbers going forward. Uh, I'll really skip over this. I've got very cold fingers uh, during that installation. And I so say I tried to work very briefly without gloves and was useless. The Sherpa team, our Sherpa colleagues that were there, they, they had their gloves off for substan substantial periods of time. And that's the difference between success and failure. It was their ability to work up there that allowed us to connect those wires that allow us to fill in the gaps. We now know what the, what the temperatures are like up there. During the spring, wind chill temperatures, if you look at the purple, very unusual to get anything below minus 40 at the summit. In winter, our estimates from the limited observations we have says it gets down to minus 80, the wind chill, one of the most extreme cold climates on Earth. And we are now, I'll finish up by saying, that you know, going back to that heuristic, that the bigger picture, what are we doing? We're slowly filling in the gaps up there. This is a, a sequence from a time-lapse camera that's sitting at base camp. And it's taking pictures twice daily of Mount Everest. And the weather stations are filling in that, that map, that contour surface, telling us what the temperatures, what the wind speeds, what the air pressure, what that's doing up there. And we're slowly filling in that blank spot, that black space. As we're getting more data from these stations. That will continue. The stations at the top need lots of maintenance. Every day, every hour of data, they uh, provides us with something to both improve our understanding of how these high-altitude ice masses are and may respond to climate change, and also how the weather may endanger people's lives and how we can perhaps provide better warning. So I think with that, I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>